Hi, welcome to Chemistry 3007. This is uh, at the University of Western Australia and we are looking at approximate wave functions. Up till now we've talked about single determinant wave functions, we've talked about Hartree product wave functions which aren't correct, they're not anti-symmetric, and it won't surprise you to know that there are better wave functions than the Hartree-Fock wave functions. And we can derive these, the simplest way to derive better wave functions than the determinant or Hartree-Fock wave function is to use perturbation theory. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about MP2 Moloplacid second order perturbation theory. Let me explain how that works. Okay, Hartree-Fock theory is only the start. We can improve it using perturbation theory, which uses the idea of corrections to the approximately correct answer Hartree-Fock wave function. So we're looking for corrections to an approximate wave function, and we hope these corrections get smaller. So in or order to see how this works, suppose we have completely solved an approximate Schrodinger equation for all its eigenstates. So for example, we might have solved a Hartree-Fock equation for all its orbitals. This would represent this equation. H0 would be some kind of Hartree-Fock or Fock equation. This might be a, uh, an approximate uh, determinant wave function, and it's H phi equals E phi. The superscript zero is supposed to indicate that this is a zeroth order approximation. The subscript i uh, is supposed to indicate that not only have we solved this for the ground state, but we have several different determinants, perhaps made by different orbitals within this determinant, and each of these has an energy. And all of this is solved exactly, but it's approximate. We've solved an approximate problem exactly. But now we want to solve the exact problem. So we're going to have to improve this approximate solution. How do we do that? Well, this is only the first term. So what we really want to do is solve h psi equals e psi. And this would represent only the first of a series of equations that we must have to solve. So what we do is we say, OK, h, it might be build up of h naught plus a correction term. What is the correction term? Well, it's just h minus h naught, because h plus h minus h naught is the Hamiltonian. So the correction term, which we assume is small, and this 1 on the superscript of the h indicates it's of degree 1, smallness 1. h naught means it's bigger. I know naught is actually smaller than 1, but this is the zero order approximation. This is the first correction. The first correction to the Hamiltonian, we assume it's a bit smaller. And likewise, the exact wave function is built up from corrections to a Hartree-Fock determinant. So here's the Hartree-Fock determinant, zero order approximation, and it's the lowest eigenstate. So we have a zero down the bottom. And we have a first correction and a second correction and a third correction. The sum of all these corrections gives us the exact wave function. So h psi, we have a h here in brackets, we have a psi here equals e psi, we have the same psi over here, original term plus corrections, and you won't be surprised to see there are corrections to the energy eigenvalues. The first term is this E00 term uh, from the Hartree-Fock thing. By the way, this is not the Hartree-Fock energy, but it is some kind of energy. Here's the first correction term, there will be a second and a third. Now assuming these corrections get smaller, as labelled by their superscripts, we can collect together all these terms of a similar smallness. For example, we could correct together all the terms of which have a superscript zero. We can correct all the terms where the sum of the superscripts adds up to one, because something of a smallness zero times smallness one gives us smallness one. Something of smallness 1 times smallness 1 gives us smallness 2, and so on. Okay, so if we do that, we will get a series of equations. So let's see how that works. 
Collecting together all the zero order terms gives us back the original equation. That's not very exciting. Collecting together all the terms with smallness 1, taking into account that the product of two terms of different smallness has a smallness which is the sum of the two, we get this h1 times phi 0 plus h0 times psi 1. So this has smallness 1, h1 times psi 0, plus h0 times psi 1. This has smallness 1, 2. Let's go back to the previous equation to see how that happened. So h0 times psi 1, that has smallness 1, h1 times phi 0. Always looking at the superscripts here. And the same over here, we have that has to equal e0 times psi1 plus e1 times phi0, which is what we see on the right-hand side. And we can keep going. h2 phi0, smallness 2 Hamiltonian. h1 times psi1, this is smallness 2, h0 times psi2. And you can see that the sum of all these terms is e2 psi0, e1 psi1, e0 psi2. I've used phi here for the functions which are the approximate solutions which we know exactly. Psi is the terms which we have to find, the corrections, as well as E1 and E2. Obviously we can keep going to higher order terms here, but I won't. And also there's no term H2, because by construction we don't have a term of smallness 2 in this particular case. In some other applications we might. So we can drop that term already. Okay, so we have a series of three equations here to get us started. The first one's already solved, exactly. We know what these are, and we know these energies. So the strategy is to try and find expressions for the energy corrections, E1 and E2, and the wave function corrections, Psi1 and Psi2, in terms of the exact approximate solutions, curly E0 and exact approximate wave functions phi zero and we can use not only the ground state energy but all the excited state approximate energy solutions too how the hell are we going to make progress here well you know we've been dealing a lot with vectors and so far all we've ever done is take inner products and you know what that's what we're going to do we're going to take inner products so first, we rewrite the second equation, uh, because that's the first one that really has terms in it that we want to know, like E1 and Psi1, and we inner product with something. We're going to inner product it with Psi0. So here's the second equation rearranged. I've just put all the, I've, I've separated all the E1 terms onto the left and the E0, the, the zero terms onto the left, the Hamiltonian zero terms. And, that, and now I'm going to inner product each side with phi naught because we know what phi naught is. So let's do that. Inner product that left side and right side with phi naught. Fine. Right. Then what can we do from this first line? Well, um, on the right hand side, uh, what we can do is. If only h0 could act on psi0, but it's on the left-hand side, but we can do something about that. Uh, h0 uh, minus e0 is a Hermitian operator, so we can swap these terms around, provided we complex conjugate it. So we take the phi0 onto the right, the psi1 onto the left, and we take the complex conjugate. Now things are on the right, and h0 can act on the right. So h0 phi0 gives us e0. h0 phi0 gives us e0. So that's e0 minus e0 gives us 0. Great. The right-hand side is eliminated if we dot product it with phi0. On the left-hand side, it doesn't. We've still done nothing to the left-hand side, but wait, wait. Uh, now we have phi0 naught h1 phi0 naught. We can bring that, uh, leave that on the left-hand side and phi naught integrated with phi naught, assuming it's normalized, is 1. So actually we've solved for E1. Bringing the E1 over to the right-hand side and reversing, uh, E1 is the expectation value in the product of H1 with 
final and final on the left and right, sandwiched. We call that an expectation value. Now that's h1. h1 is equal to h minus h0. So you can see that if I put a h0 in here, I'm going to get a minus e0, which I can then bring over to the right-hand side. So e0 plus e1 is just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, the unchanged Hamiltonian. h1 was the difference in the Hamiltonian between the exact Hamiltonian and h0, but here we have the exact Hamiltonian. So we have worked out a rather simple expression for both e0 and e1. Okay, but unfortunately we already know uh, we, we already know what this is. This is the expectation value of a determinant wave function if we were starting from the Hartree-Fock wave function. So actually we haven't learned anything just yet. We haven't learned anything because just this is just a uh, this would work out to be the Hartree-Fock energy. E0 plus E1 would be the Hartree-Fock energy. If we want a real correction, we need to go one higher. We need E2. We need E2. So let's look at E2. Um, let's do another dot product. Let's see if we can work out psi1 first, the wave function correction. Let's try an inner product with phi naught i. We did the inner product with phi naught naught, so let's do phi naught i. That's the original equation here, sorry, the second equation in the list. That's the second equation here, dotted on the left with phi naught i, not phi naught zero. So here we have phi naught i, it's nearly the same. Um, again, we reverse uh, the sign. Uh, the order of the terms over here, and now instead of e naught naught minus e naught naught, we get e naught i minus e naught naught, and this should be phi naught subscript i. I don't know why there's an l i here. I'm a bit dyslexic on my typing. I think you've seen that by now. So there's an e naught i minus e naught naught energy difference. These are the energy differences of our exact approximate solutions. And we have an overlap of phi naught i with our first wave function correction. By the way, whenever we project a wave function onto a vector, we find out its coefficient. So this is actually the coefficient of the wave function correction in terms of the original exact approximate solutions. It's a bit hard to say. It's a bit of a tongue tie. On the left hand side, we have again nearly the same thing. Instead of phi naught naught, we have now phi naught i h1 phi naught naught. So we can solve for this coefficient over here. Phi naught i projected onto psi 1 uh, gives us the matrix element phi naught i h phi naught naught. I've replaced h naught with h1 again. We can do that uh, because phi naught i is orthogonal to phi naught naught. You, you can work through that and see that um, if we subtract the e naught term, the h naught term from that, we will get zero. So we can replace that with h. Fantastic. We've made progress. So we've solved for the coefficient of psi 1, that's this number here on the left, in terms of the basis vector psi naught i. I should say, should be an i. Cool. If we want a complete expression for psi 1, we can use the resolution of the identity. So here we have psi 1 correction. Over here, in this summation over here, we have some ket bra of some basis states, and you will remember from previous lectures that this is just the identity operator. There's a bit of a change here because we should have i equals 0, but by assumption, we assume that uh, psi 1, the first correction, by assumption, we assume that it's orthogonal to our zero order state. There's no point having a correction which has already some part of it which belongs to our original wave function. What we want is a correction which is different to our original wave function. So that means it has to be orthogonal. So we can put here i equals zero. 
And if we really want to find out what this matrix element is, we can substitute in what we just found. So there we have the full expression for the correction in terms of energy differences of our approximately solved problem done exactly and matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in terms of our approximately known wave functions. Everything on the right hand side here is known except for this integral. We have to work it out in terms of one and two electron terms and so on. Right, let's keep going. We have a psi1 but what we really wanted was an expression for E2, not psi1. You won't be surprised to know that E2 will, de will depend on the correction psi1. So let's keep going. We've done everything we can do with the second uh, correction term. So let's look now at the, correction, the third perturbation equation, the one involving E2. That's the first term that involves E2. And here I've rearranged it uh, by putting uh, all the terms which don't involve H0 and E0 on the right-hand side. So that's what I did over here. And you can see that I have taken H0 and E0 and I've put them over to the right-hand side and all the other terms have gone on to the left-hand side. So I end up with a minus H0 minus E0 all negative times H2 on the right-hand side. So let's see that. A minus H0 minus E0 times second order correction. And I'm going to inner product all this with psi naught naught. Because why not? So I do that and I get these set of equations. The right hand side turns out to be zero again because I have an E0, zero, zero. When I do uh, when I swap this around and use the Hermitian idea, that again becomes zero. So all we're left with is the first two terms on the left. And um, it turns out that the H2 term we don't have, so we can skip that one. Then we are left with phi 0, 0, E2, phi 0, 0. If that's normalized, we can have a minus E2 on the left-hand side. Why don't we bring that over to the right-hand side? And we're left with this term, phi 0, 0, H1, psi 1 correction. That's uh, preserved in here. What about this E1? It looks like it's zero, and that's correct because phi zero zero overlapping with our correction term. We don't want that to have an overlap with any of that. So this overlapped with psi one times the E1 term is zero. So all we're left with is H1. And we can do the same trick and replace H1 with H0. So there we have an expression for E2 in terms of the overlap with our original ground state, the Hamiltonian and the wave function correction, which we just worked out. So if we plug in the wave function correction into there, that was this equation down here, it has a fine naught in there, we end up with this expression. E2 is negative sum over i not equal to zero, matrix element of phi naught i, excited state of our approximate solution with h psi naught naught, our ground state determinant, squared, that comes out on the numerator, on the denominator we have an energy difference. E naught i minus E naught naught. E naught i is an excited state approximate energy lying above the Hartree-Fock energy. So this is a positive denominator. This is a positive term because it's a norm squared. So we have a positive divided by a positive, all multiplied by a negative. So this is an always a negative correction. Mm. That's what we expect. Uh, the variational theorem says that the Hartree-Fock energy lies above the exact energy. So the first correction should be negative, and it is. So already we have something that looks right by sign. How good is it? Well, we're never going to find out until we actually plug certain things in for these energies and approximate wave functions. We can do that. And that's what you're going to do. Um, in the first assignment pre-work question, you're going to work out the expression for E2. It's going to involve one and two electron matrix elements. And you won't be surprised to know that it doesn't involve anything higher than determinants which differ by two orbitals. 
That's because the Hamiltonian involves only two electron terms. There are no other terms uh, involving excited determinants, determinants which differ from the Hartree-Fock determinant by more than one, more than two orbitals, and we have energy differences over here. So get that expression. This is in terms of spin orbitals. Then you will have to integrate that over spin to obtain this very nice formula for the second order energy in terms of restricted spatial orbitals for an even electron system. And in the lab, you'll program that. This formula is from Head Gordon, 1988. Martin's uh, an expatriate Australian, now a big professor at Berkeley University. And it's, he's written many lovely papers, and uh, this is one of them. So, good luck with that. If you need help, you know where to get it. See you later.